In the previous video, we illustrated the meaning of contravariant and covariant vector components. We said that contravariant components transform in the opposite fashion compared to basis vectors under a change of coordinates, and we said that covariant components transform in the same manner. Contravariant components are specified using superscripts, and covariant components are specified using subscripts. In this video, we're going to provide more rigorous definitions of contravariant, covariant, and even invariant components. I'll begin with a short and convenient memory aid. If you're confused about whether to use a superscript or subscript for a contravariant or covariant index, just look at the third letter in contravariant and covariant. For contravariant, the third letter is a small n, which effectively points up. This should remind you that contravariant components are specified with the index in the superscript. The superscript is up just like how the letter n points up. For covariant, the third letter is V, which points down. This should remind you that covariant components are specified with the index in the subscript, which is down just like how the letter V points down. So hopefully this memory tool should be useful. Now in order to provide mathematical definitions for contravariant and covariant, I'm going to first set things up by making a few assumptions. Say that I've got a vector defined on a subset of Rn, with two coordinate systems xi and xi bar related to each other using the coordinate transformation t. Let's now define contravariant vectors. The vector field V is set to be a contravariant tensor of rank 1, so a contravariant vector, if its components V super i in the xi coordinate system and V super i bar in the xi bar coordinate system are related by the following equation, the following law of transformation, V super i bar equals V super r times the partial derivative of xi bar with respect to xr, where i is an index that varies from 1 to n. Note that r is the dummy index on the right hand side because it occurs twice, so r is being summed over from 1 to n on the right. Let's briefly go over an example of a contravariant vector. Suppose that I had a finite parametric curve gamma in Rn which was defined using each of its coordinates xi as functions of time, where the time lies between two real limits a and b, and i is a free index from 1 to n. If you've seen my differential geometry series, then you'll recall that this is how we define parametric curves. You might also recall that the tangent vector to the parametric curve, which I'll denote by theta, is just found by differentiating each of these xi's with respect to t. Note that theta super i is the i-th component of the vector theta, where i again is a free index that varies from 1 to n. Now what if we change the coordinates from xi to xi bar using this coordinate transformation t up here? Well, in that case, the parametric equations describing our curve now become equations for xi bar, which are also functions of time, but in terms of the original coordinate system, the xi bars are functions of each of the individual coordinates, which themselves are functions of time. The components of the tangent vector for the curve in this transformed coordinate system are now theta super i bar equals the derivative of xi bar with respect to t. But using the chain rule of differentiation, the derivative of xi bar with respect to t can be written as the partial derivative of xi bar with respect to x1 times the derivative of x1 with respect to t plus the partial of xi bar with respect to x2 times the derivative of x2 with respect to t, and so on. I can make this right-hand side more compact using Einstein notation and replacing the x1s, x2s, etc. with just xr. Note that r is a dummy index that runs from 1 to n. We have to sum these n terms on the right to get our derivative in the new coordinate system dxi bar dt. Now the derivative of xr with respect to t if we go up is actually just the tangent vector component from before the coordinate transformation which is theta super r. So we can write the new tangent vector component theta super i bar as the old tangent vector component theta super r times the partial derivative of the new coordinate xi bar with respect to the old coordinates xr. Again, remember that r is the dummy index, so it's being summed over. If you look at this equation and compare it to the transformation law that we had when we define contravariant vectors, they look pretty much the exact same with the exception of the theta instead of the v. The indices in both equations are in the superscript, and the partial derivative being multiplied is the partial derivative of the barred coordinate with respect to the unbarred coordinate. 
This proves that the tangent vector of a parametric curve is a contravariant vector because its components follow the transformation law of contravariant vector components. So this is an example that illustrates a contravariant vector and the transformation law that it follows. Before we get to covariant vectors, let me quickly define a weighted contravariant vector, which is a variation on the regular contravariant vector. In some situations, tensors are given certain weights, and instead of a regular contravariant transformation law, the components of the tensor follow a weighted transformation law given by v super i bar equals w times v super r times the partial derivative of xi bar with respect to xr where w is a real valued function denoting the weight of the tensor. Now let's talk about covariant vectors. Again, the same assumptions with the vector field and the coordinate transformation apply as the ones we used for contravariant vectors. One thing to note now is that we're using a different vector field, u. And this vector field, u, is said to be a covariant tensor of rank 1, so a covariant vector, if its components u sub i in the xi coordinate system and u sub i bar in the xi bar coordinate system are related by the following law of transformation. u sub i bar equals u sub r times the partial derivative of xr with respect to xi bar. Again, r is the dummy index on the right-hand side because it occurs twice, so r is being summed over from 1 to n on the right. Now the key difference between this transformation law and the law for contravariant vectors is that the order of the partial derivatives is switched, so when we're converting from the unbarred system to the barred system, we're multiplying by the derivative of the unbarred coordinate with respect to the barred coordinate, instead of the derivative of the barred coordinate with respect to the unbarred coordinate. Another difference is that we're using subscripts instead of superscripts for indexing, because these are now covariant components that we're dealing with, the v points down. Let's briefly go over an example of a contravariant vector. Suppose I had a differential scalar field f. Basically, if you gave f a point in Rn, it would output a scalar. That's what I mean by scalar field. This scalar field is defined on the unbarred coordinate system xi in Rn. We can also define something called the gradient of the scalar field as the vector field del f, with each component of the vector field being a partial derivative of f with respect to each of the coordinates xi. In other words, each component u sub i of del f is given by the partial of f with respect to xi, where i is a free index from 1 to n. Now what if we change the coordinates from xi to xi bar using this coordinate transformation t up here? Well, in that case, the gradient of the scalar field f would change to include partial derivatives with respect to the barred coordinates. Note that f bar is the same as f, just written in terms of the barred coordinates. So it's a composition of f and the unbarred coordinates in terms of the barred coordinates. The components of the gradient vector for f in this transformed coordinate system are now u sub i bar equals partial f bar with respect to xi bar. But using the chain rule of differentiation, the partial of f bar with respect to xi bar can be written as the partial derivative of f bar with respect to x1 times the partial of x1 with respect to x1 bar plus the partial of f bar with respect to x2 times the partial of x2 with respect to x2 bar and so on. I can make this right hand side more compact by using Einstein notation and replacing the x1s, x2s, etc. with just xr. Note that r is a dummy index that runs from 1 to n. Now we have to sum these n terms on the right to get our component in the new coordinate system, which is the partial of f bar with respect to xi bar. Now the partial of f bar with respect to xr, if we go up, is actually just the gradient vector component from before the coordinate transformation. So we can write the new gradient vector component u sub i bar as the old gradient vector component u sub r times the partial derivative of the old coordinate xr with respect to the new coordinates xi bar. Again, remember that r is being summed over because it appears twice in the right hand side. If you look at this equation and compare it to the transformation law we had when we defined covariant vectors, they look pretty much the exact same. The indices in both equations are in the subscript, and the partial derivative being multiplied is the partial derivative of the unbarred coordinate with respect to the barred coordinate. This proves that the gradient vector of a differentiable scalar field is a covariant vector because its components follow the transformation law of covariant vector components. Now generally, most vectors that you're used to seeing in physics, like displacement, velocity, acceleration, etc., most vectors are contravariant vectors. 
You probably haven't seen many covariant vectors in physics. Generally, the most well-known covariant vectors are gradient vectors. So now that we've talked about contravariant and covariant vector components, let's talk about invariant components or invariants. Invariants are mathematical objects that have an intrinsic value and are of fundamental significance. In terms of coordinate transformations, an invariant is an object that does not change under a change of coordinates. You might already know from our previous discussions that tensors are invariant objects under a change of coordinates. Their components aren't invariant in general, but the tensors themselves are invariant. Another notable example, which actually happens to come in the form of a theorem that I won't prove here, is the inner product of a contravariant vector and a covariant vector. This inner product can be written as E, which is defined as the sum of the product of the contravariant components V super J and the covariant components U sub J. Again, J is the dummy index over here, so it's being summed over from 1 to N. Now this inner product in general is invariant under a change of coordinates as long as it's defined in all the coordinate systems. This should make sense to you. A scalar like E should not vary when you change the coordinate system, just like how the temperature of New York shouldn't vary when you change the coordinates. The temperature has an intrinsic value and is independent of the coordinate system it exists in. The same is true for the inner product E of a contravariant and covariant tensor. Anyway, that should do it for this lecture. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description for you to check out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.